So you talked about the programmable IP license, which this um, is related to the legal complexity. Yeah, yeah. So uh, like Story Protocol promotes openness and collaboration for IP owners, but this could really potentially conflict with existing copyrights, uh, especially when like different countries have varying copyright regulations. And how is Story Protocol going to solve these by pro programs or codes or things? Yeah, yeah. So maybe a couple thoughts there. So first is uh, how do we harmonize different copyright regimes mm -hmm. from different countries? And luckily for us, that's a that's a very old problem that people have been facing far before AI or 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 even the internet. Of you know, if I created a Pikachu, right? And I'm Nintendo. I'm a Japanese company. I created Pikachu, and now someone in the U.S. wants to use Pikachu. It's not like they can use Pikachu for free because they're in the U.S. and we're, you know Nintendo's in Japan, right? Like this is a yeah. problem that is very global. So all the way back in 1886, there is this convention between like I think 180 plus countries, mm -hmm. so almost every country. Uh, and they basically agreed to uh, respect the basic copyright principles around the world, right? That mm -hmm. way, you you know, no matter where creativity happened, it could be at least protected everywhere else. And and so we basically leveraged that that same principle in our licenses that they should, you know, regardless of where people are creating them, they should hold broadly speaking in most countries. Now, obviously, there's going to be slight differences in enforcement. Like some countries care a lot more about enforcing copyright infringement than others, but obviously, the fundamental protection is still there, right? And so that yeah. that's kind of answers the question around, well, how do you deal with complexities that are different mm -hmm. from different countries? And uh, when it comes to, let's say, just individual IPs, let's say, you, you know, Spider-Man gets registered on Story, right? That's actually very difficult because Spider-Man has hundreds, if not thousands of existing licensing agreements where, you know, there's a lunchbox being made of Spider-Man. And so there's a deal there, made, like made 20 years ago. And then maybe three years ago, there's some movie deal for Spider-Man. And then um, maybe some soundtrack, right? Like who owns the audio rights to that movie? So if you think about Spider-Man, there's already, you know, a thousand different agreements that they've made. And so what we're focused on Story is actually like brand new IP. Because it's a lot easier, right? If you create an IP that's, let's say, on-chain native or natively programmable, then there's no existing commitments and every new commitment can be tracked on story. Excuse me, that's actually much more powerful. So that's kind of our focus. Um, and, and it's almost like, you know, we don't need to design like a, a, a precision tool for like a super complex licensing deal. We just want to capture the long tail, right? Just like you wouldn't probably be able to make a Hollywood movie using like a iPhone. Yeah. But then, you know, for most people, you can take really good high quality videos with an iPhone now, right? Like you can yeah. take uh, really high quality photos and videos and, and it works for 99% of people unless you're a Hollywood producer. That's kind of how we think about IP. It's like most IP can can fit really well with story because we we actually have quite a flexible system, but not quite as flexible as let's say tracking everything that Spider-Man, like the, an existing IP does, right? Mm -hmm. But we think the next next big IP, the next Spider-Man that hasn't been created yet could be created on story and then we'd be able to track everything from day one. So... You just said that you're going to make brand new IPs on Story Protocol. So what you're thinking is that you are not going to onboard uh, large content creators and IP owners already existing, such as Pikachu or like Disney, onto Story Protocol? So oh, I definitely, you know, it's not that we're not going to. We actually uh -huh. do have, uh, we do have deals with some really large Hollywood creators and we're very interested in working with large IPs, right? Mm -hmm. the, the question is not so much about whether we want to work with them, we are very open to, and we have a few deals with large IPs, but the question is whether it's the right model for them. Because what we've seen mm -hmm. is, I'll just give you an example, the history of content, like for example, YouTube, it's it's never the mainstream incumbents that want to adopt a new technology. That's just ne usually not the case. So with YouTube, it wasn't the Hollywood world that went on YouTube from day one and said, this yeah, is true. great. This, let me create a Holly five minute Hollywood video. It was a random people like Fred, Annoying Orange, Nika <laughs> yeah. like, you know, all these random people who had iPhones in an internet connection for the first time. And then they're the ones that had, n they had no other option, right? They were not going to go to Hollywood. They the only way for them to make a video and get an audience was YouTube. And so story is now just like YouTube, right? It's unlocking this new set of creators that don't have any other options, but now here's a better option. And, and, you know, after a decade, YouTube now, Mr. Beast is probably making more than most Hollywood writers. So, you know, if not all, right. And mm -hmm. so we think that in 10 years story, like creators on story using programmable IP will create the next Marvel. They will be the next Mr. Mr. Beast on story, but it's not going to be probably, it's not probably not going to be like Disney being the first adopter, right? That's rarely the case. And so our thesis is not that we don't want these IPs or that we're not going to target them, but that in general, what we've seen from the previous eras of content on the internet is that it's always a new class of creators that's unlocked that then becomes the power users in the early days. So 
I think what you are saying is that Story Protocol is going to make a new era of like for content creators. And so what strategies do you have to attract these um, content creators or IP holders? Yeah. Like small, so, small ones. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll be honest, like what we, I mean, similar to, let's say uh, like an Apple app store, right? If you mm-hmm. think about, let's say the, 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 the executive at Apple in charge of the app store, uh, they're not, they're not going to go and buy a gaming studio to build Clash of Clans in Apple, right? Mm-hmm. They want Supercell to build Clash of Clans and they want Yelp to build a food review platform and they want, uh, you know, uh, ChatGPT to build like a, an AI chatbot, right? So, or open AI to build an AI chatbot, right? So the, the model there is very much support the best entrepreneurs and allow them to target their end users. And with IP, it's very similar because, you know, there's, there's so many different types of IP. There's, uh, podcasts, there's, uh, AI models, there's, um, you know, music remixing. And so we're not going to, you know, we're not going to systematically build an app in house for every single type of, of, uh, of use case. And so what we're doing is a very developer builder centric go to market strategy. And our thesis is basically, you know, uh, creators are not using story directly, just like who's, who's using Ethereum directly. Like, I guess people who are sending ether back and forth, right? Like that, that kind of, that's one use case. And maybe that's, that's some people, but most people are interacting with an application on mm-hmm. Ethereum, right? Um, they're interacting with Uniswap, they're interacting with OpenSea, they're interacting with Blur. And so our thesis is, you know, ultimately the apps own the creators and the creators are going to onboard onto the apps that really serve their use cases. And the apps will register the IP that way. So we have a very ecosystem focused approach, a developer and app focused approach, kind of like an app store model. Um, obviously, unlike the app store, we're not trying to take 30% or be a rent seeking central intermediary that gatekeeps the whole thing, right? Anyone can permissionally use story. That's why we're built on blockchain. But uh, from a go to market strategy perspective, it is similar in the sense of we're focusing on builders. So this is kind of similar a question uh, you ask, uh, I ask for you, but story protocol is very ecosystem centric. So how are you going to uh, Oh, onboard all those developers. And, uh, is there a reason that those developers bit to build on story protocol will be their reason? And how are you going to onboard all of those developers? Yeah. Well, it's definitely yeah. not a, there's no magic wand, right? So, yeah, I mean, true. any startup, like there's no, if there were an easy way to just, uh, onboard a million developers, then, you know, mm-hmm. we would do it. So yeah. it's, it's just about putting in the effort every day and doing things that don't scale. Right. So you have to, you have to, you know, be able to communicate the technology very simply. You have to be able to, uh, you know, be willing, you know, we have developers that are actually helping developers, uh, partner developers integrate, uh, on the code level, right? Just like looking through their code, helping them debug. Um, and then also taking the, the feedback of the early partners. Like we oftentimes have two meetings a week, if not more with our ecosystem partners, um, per partner. And we actually have given the keys to our office to some ecosystem builders to come in every day and work out of our office. So learning very quickly from what works and what doesn't being willing to be scrappy and, and go to go to bat for them and showing that we're going to add the most value and, 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 you know, understand our users the best. Then once a few ecosystem apps succeed, then everyone will see, right? Like it, it's, it's, it'll speak mm-hmm. for itself. But at first it's really about getting those first few killer apps built, um, doing everything we can to support them because their success is our success. And then ultimately letting that, that success stand on its own and, and be its own marketing. Um, obviously there's other things like having better documentation or, or better developer exper- experience that those things are important, but ultimately like the two things that need to happen is one, we need to truly support ecosystem projects with marketing, with development, with office space, with investor, investor introductions, whatever it is. And then the second thing is that um, we need to be solving a real problem for them, right? Like they need to believe that we are, and they need to come to us wanting to have a prop, like solve a problem for their business or their, their end users. And, and not just for like, you know, building on a new L1. So th- those are our kind of our criteria mm-hmm. and we're doing things that don't scale. And ultimately um, our success will be its own sort of marketing, I think. So you've mentioned the killer apps should be built on story protocol. So for my per- just personal question, do you have any apps expecting to be a killer app now on the ecosystem? Yeah, well, in terms of our metrics, we have around, we have over 200 projects in the pipeline. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, and by in the pipeline, I mean, We've had at least one conversation with them. Um, most of them, we've had many more. Um, and then we have around now over 40 apps that are integrated with our API or directly with our smart contracts. And um, I believe eight or nine of them are are going to be live on day one of our public testnet, which is going to come out in the next couple of weeks. So we have a lot of projects that we're excited about, like Magma, which is a Web2 
um, creator tool that has two and a half million users. And all of them are using story without even knowing it, uh, using our blockchain without knowing it. We have, um, you know, Sekai, which is a really, really cool, like AI web comics app where you can create a comic, the music, the characters, the art, it's all AI. You can use AI to quickly generate a, like kind of like a full, almost Hollywood level, like web comic and instant. But then every single character, um, you, if you create a character, someone else can license your character in very easily, like an IP Lego. Mm-hmm. And that character can actually be created on another app. So if I created a character on Magma, registered it on story, someone else using Sekai could see it and then use it and then pay me. Um, so uh, we have a lot of apps that we're really excited about, um, AI apps as well, um, like uh, Mahojin, which is like the sort of character AI style app where um, anyone can create like a image and then use AI to re- like you use AI to remix other people's images or, or IP. But then when you use AI to, you know, build on top of someone else's IP, that original person gets compensated, right? So which totally inverts the model of AI now, which is like, you put your IP somewhere, and then the AI takes it, and then you don't even know the AI is taking it, the AI is making lots of money off your IP, you might not even know, it's completely inverting the model where now it's explicit around, you know, uh, you're, you're paying um, uh, the original creator and building like the sort of incentive alignment together. So those are just, you know, some examples off the top of my head. But we have like, eight or nine very strong apps that are going to be live on public testnet. And I think that the interesting thing about them is like, it's not like we, we definitely do need some basic DeFi infra, right? Like that's important for any blockchain, but it's really not like a bunch of clones of like things that have already worked on Ethereum, right? Like it's just not, it's not like a rebranded, reskinned, uh, you know, new, you know, incentive program version of some existing app. They're actually quite new. Like these apps are either existing apps with PMF that mm-hmm. just had a problem that we're solving or they're brand new apps that are thinking about, well, there's this new primitive, how can we use it? Right. So I think that's probably the thing I'm most excited about is that we are really focused on like apps that are story only. Right. And so we kind of ask ourselves, like, is this something that only can be built on story? And if so, then it's like more exciting for us to, to support. I think that, I think that's the important part, the apps only on story protocol. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people are waiting for the story protocol testnet. Yeah. And yeah. Also, Korean users are also looking for a story protocol testnet. Mm-hmm. So I think you guys have a strong interest in expanding into the Korean market. Could you share why the Korean market is probably uh, particularly appealing to you and what the Korean market can give to story protocol? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I think if you look at IP, you can't ignore Korea, right? I mean, that that's yeah. uh, no one can argue against that because... But I mean, there's still a lot of the biggest IPs in the world are obviously in the US, like I'm not going to debate that either. But if you look at the box office every year, the top movies in the US is sequel after sequel, right? 2022 is probably the worst. You can look it up 2022. Every single one of the top 10 grossing films in the US were sequels. Every single one. It was like, I don't know, Shrek 3, (laughs) Spider-Man 17, Avengers 45, right? Like there's just, it's the same thing. They're milking it, right? And so, yeah, these these are massive IPs. Harry Potter's a massive IP. But when you think about new, fresh, exciting, dynamic IPs, it's coming out of Korea. It's Parasite. It's it's New Jeans, right? It's Blackpink. It's BTS. Um, and things are hap- moving so quickly here, right? Squid Games. Um, uh, so there's just there's so many interesting IPs coming out of Korea, and that you pair that like dynamism and 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 uh, talent in IP creation with, I think a community that actually really does understand like how to do on chain activity, right? Like in the U.S. Actually, I mean, there's a lot of people in the U.S. in the West, um, but to be honest, like. Percentage wise, I think Korea has a very, very high account of people who actually like to do things on chain, right? So now you have this really good combination of strong IPs, like people who understand the value of IPs in Korea that are good at making them. And then also people that understand the value of blockchain and understand, you know, have the basic skills to use a blockchain. That's kind of our sweet spot, right? And of Mm -hmm. course, like my co-founder SY being Korean, like he's here almost all the time. And so that's just the third reason to really like invest in an area that we are more familiar with, that we think has really strong IP and then also super crypto native. I really hope that a lot of Korean IPs should be built on story, story protocol. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I honestly should learn Korean. <laughs> yeah, true. Maybe I can teach you too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think this will be our last question. So what does the future of AI look like without story? Um, and how do you see story impacting the content industry in the five years or the next 10 years? Right. Yeah. So if you look at the world that we're in now and like what AI, it, the path it's currently headed on, it's not very, it's not very hopeful. I would say it's a little bit um, scary, actually. And the path that we're headed on is what I would call like a tragedy of the commons, which is kind mm-hmm. of a common economics term uh, to describe a situation when you have this public good 
that everyone can use, but then no one is contributing back to, right? So then yeah. that public good disappears. It's like clean water, right? Okay, everyone can drink from the clean water, but then if no one is actually in charge of cleaning the water, then and eventually no one has clean water and everyone's suffering, right? So that tragedy, the common situation is happening with a, the internet data, right? And, and internet IP, because uh, if you think about the internet as this like grassy field, right? Or this clean river, um, what it contributes to this field, like it's, it's, it's uh, Redditors, it's people on Quora, it's people... Uh, photographers on Shutterstock, it's people posting on Instagram, creating TikTok videos, right? That's like the interesting part of the internet. It's all the content that everyone in the world is able to contribute. Um, but now you have these large model companies that are going, oh, great, like here's a, a great field. And now I'm going to take all the, all the, all the crops, right? And I'm not going to replant any seeds. So if you're open AI, you're taking all this data. It's great for you. You're building the best model in the world. You know, you're one of the world's most valuable companies. Um, but then again, you're not compensating anyone, right? And so what happens is this field just dries up. If you are a, let's say a travel blogger, right? Like you write a travel blog and, uh, you know, about your trip to Paris before, like if you got some views, Google might give you some ad money, right? It's not, maybe not the best deal yeah. ever, but at least like if you got views, like you would got compensated because you could put ads on your own blog. Now you can write as good of a blog as you want, but even if it's amazing, it's probably just more likely to get eaten up by perplexity, right? And then someone asks, Hey, like, what do I do in Paris? Maybe your travel blog just gets condensed by AI into one bullet point. Now no one's visiting your blog and no one even knows it's you. So if you're a travel blogger, well, you're thinking this isn't worth it anymore. Like, why am I putting all this effort to basically be like a labeler for an AI company and not get paid? So what happens is this field dries out. Like the travel blogger quits, the people on Reddit quit, um, the, and then the, the water gets dirty. And, and so if you're an individual creator, you quit. That's not good for you. If you're like a platform, like a Reddit or a social media platform, your users are going away. So you're going away. So that's not good for the platforms. And then if you are an AI company, well, you don't have any clean water anymore, right? You have, you don't have any crops to, to harvest anymore. So in the long run, this is just kind of a tragedy of the commons, bad situation for everyone. And so our, our thesis is that story, like you need to find a way where people can continue to harvest crops. People can continue to have clean water, but they have a way or an incentive to keep that water clean, to keep the crops growing, right? And so that the only way to do that is to align the incentives between the creators and the AI model trainers so that you can still continue to train on data. Like we're not, we're not anti-progress and I'm certainly not anti-AI. I, I'm very, very excited about AI that, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about it and I still really deeply believe in, in its potential, but like you need a way to allow these model creators to use data, but use it in a way that's sustainable, right? So that's kind of what Story's trying to do. I really hope that Story Protocol will make the sustainable AI era. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So do you have any words to say to the Korean IP holders or Korean content creators? Yeah, well, I would say that at the end of the day, like we exist to solve problems for you. So the best that, you know, the best thing that we could work on together is we're going to launch our public test net very, very quickly. You will see all the apps that are being built on story. Um, and we'll have many different apps where you can register your IP, make it programmable, and then invite your community and your fans uh, and others to build on top of your IP, whether it's with AI, whether it's without AI, um, there's going to be a lot of different options. And, you know, I would just really love for you guys to, to try out story. And also give us feedback, right? Even if it's critical feedback, that's super useful. It's it's extremely early what we're doing and kind of novel. So we're definitely going to make mistakes and, and learn along the way. So just appreciate anyone if you have, you know, uh, the interest to try us out. And then, you know, I'm always, my job is to basically listen to, to your feedback. And so if you have complaints, if you have compliments, please let me know. Um, our public testnet will be out very soon. Thank you, Jason. Yes, thanks for having me. Yeah. 오늘은 스토리 프로토콜 코파운더 제이슨 자원님과 인터뷰를 통해 스토리 프로토콜의 비전 그리고 앞으로의 계획에 대해 깊이 있는 이야기를 나눌 수 있었습니다. 스토리 프로토콜이 IP의 블록체인 분야에서 어떤 변화를 이끌어갈지 같이 지켜봐 주시면 좋을 것 같습니다. 지금까지 블록 미디어의 정윤재였습니다. 앞으로 더 좋은 인터뷰 들고 오겠습니다. 감사합니다. 네.